This is the Teachable Soul Podcast. Because we cannot possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves, let's take a few moments to learn from the mistakes of others. The Teachable Soul Podcast, where guests and listeners like you share stories of failure and teachable moments on the journey to success. Here's your host, Kat Daniels. Welcome to the Teachable Soul Podcast. I am your host, Kat Daniels, and today with me, I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. David C. Smalley, who is a comedian, actor, podcast host, and author. On his podcast, which used to be called The Dogma, Dogma Debate for 10 years, he combines his love for entertainment and media with his passion for skepticism. Dogma Debate, or now the David C. Smalley Show, is a podcast focused on educating the public with humor and unique, respectful discussions. David has appeared on CNN, Fox, Newsmax TV, The Adam Carolla Show, More Stories with Jay Moore, and many radio shows and podcasts encouraging humanism and extended peaceful and respectful challenges to dogmatic claims. We are fortunate to have him as our guest today to talk about parenting, but specifically single fatherhood. Since the passing of my father last year, I wanted to do something special to celebrate Father's Day. And so I wanted to speak to David on this specific topic to get the perspective of a single father because my father was was a single father and I don't have him here to talk to or interview unfortunately but also because I think that our combined experiences and discussion here today will help other single fathers out there or future single fathers welcome David and thank you so much for offering to come on and speak with me today hey thanks for having me absolutely so you kind of wanted to discuss that you real quick don't call your show the dogma debate even though if i search up your show that's what comes up <laughs> yeah well it still is the same sh show it's the same concept so um i, I just wanted to clarify really that mm. people are like wait is it gone does that mean i can use the name dogma debate now for my show no it's still a, it's still a segment on my show but i found that uh people were hesitant to come on sometimes mm -hmm. because it sounded too confrontational and if you listen to the show it's so respectful and like uh, sort of extending an olive branch to someone who I disagree with. And uh, it's not intimidating at all to come on the show. So it was kind of a, a branding issue. And being that I'm in LA and I've got a couple of agents and a manager and a publicist, they basically collectively were like, you've got to use your name for more stuff. So it may sound like I'm stroking my own ego by just calling <laughs> it my name. But the reality is the website has been davidcsmalley.com forever. I've had David C. Right. on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and everything. And so having a podcast with a different name that I'm using for my website uh, has just been confusing for my publicist. So this was the final step. Just call it the David C. Smalley Show. In fact, we drop the and show off of it. It's just David C. Smalley. But if you search dogma or dogma debate, I have 466 episodes and I think 465 of them are under dogma debate. So you're still going to find me either way. And we're still having the same friendly discussions, but it sort of broadens the scope of the show. Now we talk, we can talk more about about um, anything that is a dogma or anywhere where I want to sort of challenge someone's skepticism on something. It doesn't have to be religiously based, but right. I do have more religious based episodes coming. So it's the same basic concept without, without pigeonholing me into a certain area because of the title. That's all. Yeah, no, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about your show is that you, you also talk about like politics and just philosophy in general on there. And that's partially why I enjoy listening to it. So cool. Thank you course so you so let's start um by just discussing you obviously didn't start out as a single father you were married can you go a little bit like into the the process of of getting divorced and becoming a single father and what happened in the beginning sure and i want to say too uh, you know <clears throat> calling me a single father is technically right um i i do have uh custody of my daughter and um um, even when I was married, I was always the, the primary uh, caretaker and, and the primary provider. Um, but my daughter's mom is in her life. Like it's not that she just no, of course. completely. So some people get confused when you say a uh, single father, they think you're just all alone completely. And that's not really the case. I mean, her mom's in her life um, and, you know, is, is, you know, financially helping, takes her places, goes and does things with her is, is very much, it. she helped me buy a car for her for her birthday. Um, so we get along and uh, it's, 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 it's a cool situation now. It hasn't always been that way as many people could, could understand because of a divorce. Right, of course. Um, but yeah, we were, we divorced in 2011 and a lot of the listeners of my show didn't realize that was the case. Um, even mm. after we, we did that, 
there were times where we were like, well, it makes sense to still live together and, you know, raise this, this child together and do this thing together. And so when you see someone on Facebook say it's complicated, it's one, it was, it was one of those situations for a very long time. Right. Um, and there's a lot more to that story that I won't go into for her own privacy, but mm -hmm. um, it has been very obvious <clears throat> that I've had to assume the role of a single father in, in many respects. And sometimes for long periods at a time, I am the only contact my daughter uh, would receive uh, for, for a few months at a time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, the, the original divorce though, I will say, is where we probably should start because I don't know how it is in California. Uh, I've, I've only been here for four years, but growing up in Texas, if you're a dad, you, you're kind of looked at as automatically the secondary parent mm -hmm. and the oh, mother is, is the primary parent. And, and so whenever we, we talk about certain aspects of privilege in life, and I just did an entire podcast about, Black Lives Matter and the role of white privilege and how it is a real thing and how I've been able to convince other people who thought it wasn't real that it is real. Um, there are certain areas of life where where women have privileges and men don't. Mm -hmm. And one of those areas, I think, is the court system, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I like to say we were kind of victimized by our generation of dads twice, uh, men who were, you know, in their 30s and 40s today, because dads that were that are that were our father's ages um sort of screwed up the system for us because they would they would be married for 30 years and then their their wife would be a homemaker and then they would just decide to leave their wife for their hot secretary mm -hmm. and the mother had no where to go and had no job, no trade, no experience, and was just kind of screwed. Yeah. And the government rightfully said, you can't just do that. She has no way to earn money. And mm -hmm. you wouldn't have been as successful as you were if she wasn't taking care of the kids and making your lunches and ironing your shirts and being that leave it to beaver lifestyle. Yeah. So yeah, you worked hard, but you wouldn't have been able to do it without your wife. So pay her something, right? Mm -hmm. That made sense. And so guys who, guys like me who grew up with single moms, um, then became fathers, right? So we kind of got screwed as kids because our dads weren't around or paid minimal child support here and there and, and just kind of left. Right. Um, and then we become fathers and we go, I'm not going to let my daughter have that experience, right? I'm going to be involved. I'm going to be that super dad. Mm -hmm. But when you show up to court, that judge sees you just like your father and right. treats you like, nope, the mom has custody. You're going to pay. It was immediately, how much money do you make? And I was like, wait a minute, what? why aren't we talking about who the better parent is or, or who's the most stable parent or 50-50 mm -hmm. joint conservatorship or sharing custody? And anytime I started to talk about that, the judge would literally bang his gavel, say, order in the court, answer my question, how much money do you make? Mm -hmm. I, I, it was never even a, a thought that I could have custody of my daughter. Right. And I had to fight and fight and fight. And eventually I ended up in this weird position from a divorce perspective. Mm -hmm of having my daughter 53% of the time, but still paying child support to my ex-wife. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's after taxes, right? So I pay all right. the taxes on the money and then she gets a, a large sum of money out of my check. And then she doesn't have to claim that on her taxes and then she got to claim my daughter on her taxes as a dependent. And I'm like, right. I should be able to claim both of you as a dependent. I'm paying so much money out. And it ended up so bad. And the system is so broken mm -hmm. that I was completely broke. I was paying the mortgage. I was paying all the bills. As a matter of fact, the judge ordered me to pay $900 a month worth of her bills in addition to paying her 50% of every one of my checks for what he called temporary spousal support until the divorce was final. And it was a terrible situation. And I ended up so broke that she had all of this surplus income. And so when my daughter visited her, it was like this, you know, they could go to hockey games and basketball games and, and hang out and go to parades. And when you came to dad's house, it was like, I'm, I have nothing. I can't do anything with you. And it got so bad that 
I ended up losing my job, went on unemployment. And because I had had a six figure income at the time, I, uh, had the maximum child support, uh, maximum, uh, unemployment, which I think in Texas at the time was four four hundred and thirty dollars a week or four sixteen a week or something. So already my income has drastically dropped. Right. And she was making about forty thousand a year at her job Mm -hmm. and getting all my child support. They started taking fifty percent of my unemployment checks. Jeez. So I I went from, you know, I think it was like one hundred and seventeen thousand a year is what my income was back then. And then dropping down to you know, whatever $400 a week is, and then cutting that to $200 a week. So I went to living on 800 a month. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about, I'm starting to lose the house. I'm starting to have my, my car is about to be repoed. I can't afford my child support. And, and it was never thought to, you know, maybe if, if you're making less money, maybe we stop child support. Or if you're making the same, maybe nobody pays. How about we just even it out for the quality of life of the child? It wasn't, it wasn't about, let's talk about finances. It was like the person with the penis pays the person without the penis. Mm. And it, it's so old fashioned and traditional. And it took me years to fight and fight and fight just to be considered an equal parent. And I finally was able to, and uh, through a crazy series of events, by the time I got to California, believe it or not, mm-hmm. they were the ones going, well, let's look at the situation. Let's see what's really going on here. And it, it, no, nobody should have to go through that. I don't think any mother should have to go through that or father. But it seems that fathers sort of start on um, kind of a uh, – women definitely get a head start in the justice system when it comes to kids. And, and that and was divorce. a divorce. Yeah. 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 No, I completely agree. I mean, my, my parents went through a divorce, um, and my mother wasn't um, – a bad parent at the time um, at all, but she, my, my father made the majority of the income. And the only thing in, this was in Kansas, this was uh, 20, more than 25 years ago. So, um, I mean, obviously it's a little bit outdated and I don't know what they're doing now, but that's, that's kind of what happened to him. He, um, a little bit of what happened to him. He, I mean, multiple times. So the only thing that she had to do was stay in town. She wasn't allowed to leave the, the vicinity basically with town. me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she wasn't allowed to leave the county with me. Well, the problem, part of the problem was, was that there was only one town in the entire county because so like that was the only place that she could work or live. Like she didn't have very many options yeah. and it was a smallish town. And so there were occasions where like, for instance, we moved um, about 45 minutes away. And I don't know exactly if she told him that she was doing this or not, but when I guess the court found out they made her move back. There was another instance where she pretty much legitimately kidnapped me, honestly, um, and took me to Kansas city because, but when, once she got there, she called him and was like, look, my mom has cancer. I had to go. I didn't have a choice. And I knew that you weren't going to let me take her. So I had like, and they were able to talk it out. And he even agreed. Okay. You have one year, you stay there for one year with her. I will drive eight hours to come and see her every other weekend. And he did. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, she just kept breaking the court orders is what it came down to. Um, Mm -hmm. And so he finally did get custody of me when I was like 10. But by that time, he was broke too. I mean, he lost his business. He lost his house that he owned. He was completely broke because they kept having to go back and forth to court and, you know, figure everything out. But yeah, it's a sad system. I, I, men have this sort of locker room cigar shop sort of thing that they do where they'll laugh and say, ha ha, cheaper to keep her. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and it sounds terrible, but in some cases, it's like it's not stay, wrong. Stay in the miserable situation that you're unhappy in, mm-hmm. uh, in order to not lose everything. And it's so unfortunate that our system forces people to be unhappy instead of just allowing people to be happier apart and yeah. work together. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the, a lot of what happened during the divorce was not my ex's fault. Mm-hmm. The attorneys and his everyone to pay attention to 
the attorneys do not give a damn about you. Yeah. They will make you think they care, (laughs) but think about it. They're Mm -hmm. making anywhere from a hundred to $300 an hour Mm -hmm. based on your fight. Right. And so they will push you to ask for ridiculous things Mm -hmm. to make the other person pissed off. And the other person's pissed off. They will demand ridiculous things because the longer you fight, Mm -hmm. the more they get paid. Imagine if you both showed up day one and said, we agree on everything. That's why those divorces cost like 1200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Right. But the attorneys encourage you to fight. And so when I had people that I thought were on my side, I quickly realized they were. In fact, my attorney told me one time, uh, I only had her for about a month and a half and I fired her in court and I'll be happy to tell that story. Mm -hmm. But, um, she, she turns to me and she said, I just want to let you know, you are not getting custody of your daughter. I just flat out told me, and I said, why would you say that? And she said, right. look, she goes, look, she goes, your ex-wife could be a prostitute on heroin. Mm-hmm. And as long as she's not uh, being a prostitute on heroin in front of your daughter, she's getting custody. Yep. And I, I was just like, well, thanks for the vote of confidence there. I appreciate this. <laughs> this is great, you know. Right? Great um, start. Appreciate yeah. you. <laughs> and then at the same time, my ex's attorney, the original request was, and I'm not kidding, um, you move out of the house so that she gets the, the four-bedroom home on the lake. You mm-hmm. pay the mortgage that she's going to be living in, and you give her $5,000 a month for living expenses for three years. I was so angry at my ex and I was like, is she out of her mind? And we weren't talking, keep in mind, right? That's what they say. Talk Mm -hmm. to each other, speak through your attorneys. Mm -hmm. But once the dust settled and it finally was all over and we were able to sit down and talk about the crazy experience we had, she was like, I never asked for that. Mm -hmm. The attorneys were pushing for that. And the attorneys are the one that wanted to take this angle of whatever. And the, the attorneys are the one who pushed this, this idea that because you don't go to church, you're a bad father. And Because I was blaming her for stuff like that. Right, of course. I didn't have anything to do with any of that. They were doing it. And I'm like, how many times is that happening where you don't ever talk to your ex again? Mm-hmm. Or someone ends up getting shot or someone dies or someone just hates them so much they move out of the country and never see their kid again. Not realizing that the attorneys are the ones that were pushing people apart to try to keep them fighting so that they could continue to make money. It's it, the system. It's, it's a conflict of interest. It, the the goal would be to resolve things peacefully without the most harm to society. Mm-hmm. And yet attorneys are rewarded by creating carnage. And it's, it's a really unfortunate system and it, we, we need to address that for sure. Yeah. That's why I'm, I really hope that in the coming years that um, there's, Oh, what are arbitrators i believe mm-hmm. um and they're kind of like counselors sort of um but they're they're negotiators is what it turns out being but they're um usually negotiators that don't uh have to go through a legal court system to make a decision and i hope i pray that that like becomes a more accepted form of going to court and i think there are some states that have they they make you try to go through a um, it's not an arbitrator. There's another word for it. What's the word? It's an M. Does it? I think so. You know what I'm talking about. I okay. Talking about. Yeah. But anyway, so um, yeah, I hope that those become far more common. I hope that the 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 job um, becomes far more available for many many people because it's not it's not an incredible amount of schooling. It's a little bit of um, like sociology or psychology that you need, mediator. but um, it, and it's just so much more peaceful. Uh, I think mediator is what you were talking about. Mediator. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Exactly. Um, yeah. But um, there was something else I was going to say. My, um, my, that's, well, two things. So that's what my dad always said to me too. He was like, if you ever go through a divorce, do your best to avoid lawyers because they are not out for your best interest or your kid's best interest or anything. Like they don't give a crap. But also, have you seen the um, movie on Netflix called Marriage Story? No, I haven't. Okay. So I watched that movie 
Um, and I didn't realize, I always thought that growing up, I was relatively unscathed by their divorce, but I watched that movie and I realized I am not, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a movie that you should watch because it's a, it's an incredible, uh, ac incredibly accurate representation of exactly what goes on in divorce proceedings, um, especially when kids are involved. Oof. Yeah. It's quite interesting because like one of the things that 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 struck a chord with me whenever I was watching the movie was that in the movie, they have a caseworker come out to each parent's house to basically judge who is the better parent. Mm -hmm. And if I mean, in a situation like that, any parent is going to be freaked out and not in their exact normal state whenever someone is in their house just to specifically judge how they parent. Like people and parents are, are insecure about how they parent anyway, because none of us know what the heck we're doing. And so um, I remember that happening. I remember um, a couple of different times where either that happened or I was sent, I was, I as a child was court ordered to go to a psychologist with or without my parents on different occasions, because this happened multiple times. And it was, it was a horrible situation. It was uncomfortable for me. It was uncomfortable for them. It was just not, not a good, um, calm, relaxing, you know, thing. And I didn't even realize that divorce could be a, 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 a chill like event until I got into adulthood and had been married for like a couple years. I was like, Oh, like you can divorce and, and be amicable and talk to each other. I had no idea. So, <laughs> so a quick story about that uh, during the divorce, once we had separated and, and my ex-wife had moved out, I, I started dating um, this woman and, and she was also going through a divorce mm. and I was at her house. We just met, we had just literally started dating like maybe two weeks mm. and I'm sitting in her living room and we hear a, a car pull up and she goes, Oh, that's my husband. And hearing my husband, not my ex-husband, I felt, I was like, right. Wait, uh, just, <laughs> am I about to fight somebody? Like, <laughs> me? like what is going on? I, I just got stand up and I go, is everything okay? And she looks at me, she goes, yeah. What do you, what do you mean? Mm hmm. I was like, do you need me to do anything? She goes, no, it's fine. I'm just standing there like, no, we have to fight somebody, right? That's exactly. what happens. When people get divorced, things go really, really bad. And, exactly. And he walks in. He walks in the, the room and he goes, hey, you must be David. And I was like, yeah, what's up? And he walks over, shakes my hand. And then um, he looks at her and he goes, hey, uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave you both TVs uh, since the kids will be here a couple of days extra a week. And she turns to him and goes, no, sweetheart, we have these other two. You, you, you can take them. <laughs> he's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I've just got the one bedroom apartment. I just need one for the living room. It's fine. You know, I don't like to watch TV when I go to bed. And she's like, okay, well, if you change your mind, we'll, we'll leave it in the spare room. And he goes, all right. And uh, he walks over to his, he was carrying out some guitar stuff and he goes, Hey man, you, we give me a hand real quick. And I go, sure. And I'm helping him move his stuff out. And they're being so nice to each other. Right. And we left. All we did was talk about what a really good guy he was. And she's like, oh, yeah. She's like, I'm sure we'll be friends for years. But uh, we just didn't work as a couple. And I'm mm -hmm. like, if I could have gotten divorced like that, I wouldn't have wanted to get divorced. Right? That's, that's <laughs> a problem. Man. You're working through really sensitive stuff. And you're doing it like a divorce. And it's so peaceful and how is this possible and it was right. it was eye-opening because it was me you said until you were an adult and married for a few years I didn't realize until after I was divorced right. that, that something like that could be so peaceful um yeah so yeah as far as the kids you know the the whole home check or whatever with the social worker I think every parent your biggest fear is your kid just saying some something oh, ridiculous man. Yes. Kids just have no filter. And it's not that they're going to tell the truth. It's that they're going to tell some, uh, <laughs> some, they're going to say something that, that is going to be like misinterpreted by the social worker, you know? Like, oh, yeah. Like, like, let's say I'm playing basketball all the time, you know, and they're like, these friends come over a lot. Well, hold, wait, hold on. Hold on. She doesn't mean, well, yeah, they drink. They drink Gatorade. Stop yeah. with this. What are you saying? They drink a lot. She doesn't understand what drinking means. 
<laughs> like you just, you know, you're, you're in a panic the whole time. You know, I, I can totally see that. That is exactly what happened in the movie too. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> the 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 little boy was like dad do the thing show her the thing and he's like no i'm not gonna do the thing and he's like well but dad it's really funny it's really cool like just show her the thing well the thing that he was talking about was where he has regularly apparently a um a box knife in his pocket and he'll pretend he'll put the blade out and pretend like he's gonna cut himself <laughs> this is so funny i'm sorry so he'll pretend like he's gonna cut himself with it and and then of course you know pull the blade in at the last second and like slice his arm like from elbow to wrist right well and so he he tells the kid a couple times no i'm not gonna do it i'm not gonna do it well then he goes to do it but he's so nervous and freaked out that he forgot to put the blade back in and he cut his arm from like (laughs) from like elbow to wrist and the lady is like are you okay? And he's like bleeding all over the floor. And he's like, no, no, it's fine. Like, it's fine. Just trying to ignore it. Like nothing (laughs) happened. (laughs) Okay. I have to watch this movie now. You do. It's so Uh, sad, but it's so accurate. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's amazing. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we had to go through that too, by the way, they did the, Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of standard that they order that in, in most divorces. And you know, I found too, I don't know if every state's like this, but Texas made us do parenting classes that's so funny my brother actually started that program in his town in texas here's the thing though i don't mind taking the classes no of course but you should take that when you get pregnant right why exactly until half the stuff we learned in there we were like oh yeah that would have made sense in 2006 honestly (laughs) that is spot on (laughs) <laughs> why, why is the requirement for the failure of a marriage instead of when you go to the hospital to yeah. get your first prenatal vitamins and they go oh well we're we're four months along we're gonna find out the sex soon and then that right then they should be like court mandated parenting courses that's 100 oh, percent. it's yeah. it's our society is so broken in that route but oh. let's say one more thing about this divorce thing because i know you want to talk about parenting and, and that's what i'm excited to talk about but um we had one of those caseworker things, right, where they, they come to both parents. And my daughter and I have always been super close. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's funny that even when everything's right, like I was always the one, you know, I was Dr. Daddy. If she would scratch her arm, I would pick her up, throw her over my shoulder and run around making siren noises like I was taking her, you know, like 911. And I would throw her on the counter and wrap her entire, one time I wrapped her entire arm, or was it her leg? I think it was her leg, her whole leg, and <laughs> bandages and caution tape, the yellow, <laughs> yellow caution tape because she scratched on her knee. And uh, it made her go, Dad, it's not that big of a deal. I'm like, no, it's <laughs> huge. It was kind of a reverse psychology for her to be like that. It's, I, it hurt for a minute, but I'm good. I don't need all this. Right. I'm hobbling out and couldn't even bend her leg because I had so much tape on it. Uh, she's like, this is overkill. I'm pretty sure it's just a <laughs> And it kind of made her think the scratch was not that big of a deal. You know, right, of course. But yeah. um, so I was always super involved and the caseworkers negative note of me was that um, uh, I think the way she wrote it was um, the, the father and daughter are so close. Um, the daughter may have problems understanding where she begins and her father ends. Oh my God. Ugh. And I'm like, really, is this the best you got that I'm going to Right. Dad? <laughs> She clearly knows where she stops and I begin. This yeah. Ridiculous. But uh, so they'll find anything. And I honestly think if the roles were reversed, if, mm-hmm. if that was the, the problem with the mother, I don't think the social worker would have put that down. You know? Right. Of course. So yeah. and I'm, th- I'm thinking, how many houses do you go to where the dad is a drunk or gambles the money away or is using a bunch of drugs or is mm-hmm. home or doesn't know the teachers and doesn't know the friends and doesn't help with homework? I do all of those things for her as a father. And how many houses do you go to where the, the dad is actually a deadbeat and doesn't care and doesn't help? You're trying to drive a wedge at this point based yeah. on you having a connection with the female in the relationship. I mean, it's just, again, it, it's, it's, it, it's an uphill battle. I fought it. I eventually beat the system. I even fired my attorney and represented myself against my ex-wife's attorneys. And like I said, we're friendly now. A lot of things have happened. Uh, we have a decent relationship now. But it was a, it was a tough uphill battle. And I, I know lots of other men who've experienced the same thing. 
Yeah, no, me too. My brother went through the same thing um, multiple times. He's got three kids with two different ex-wives and yeah, it's, it's, it's not a system built for dads at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I think in Kansas at one point in time, my dad was actually told that he would never get custody as long as he couldn't prove that my mother basically wasn't being a prostitute doing drugs in front of me which yeah. she never was so you know that's it yeah it's a it's a crazy system and i mean back to the the parenting class thing you're a hundred percent right that should be <laughs> court mandated upon you've conceived a child here's how you be a parent period yeah. yep because even even co-parenting with a, a person that you're still the spouse with is is a necessary yeah. you know thing to learn that nobody teaches you ever that's what because i'm saying we were you know going by what our parents did and learned which obviously my parents weren't the best example of any of that so <laughs> i'm just winging it over here we all are yeah we, and that's why i'm excited to have this discussion because I, I think i've cracked the code and okay. I, I'm my daughter is just unbelievably awesome, and yeah. I can't wait to get into that because it, it's it was an experiment, and I'm happy to say it worked <laughs> out. It worked out. I didn't know for sure if it was going to work, and it worked. Yeah, I say that all the time that like children are the the craziest, just most ridiculous human experiment that I could ever think of. Like we're not allowed to experiment on humans, but people are still allowed to have children and not know what they're doing. So, you know. Oh, and there's no limit. No, none at all. None at all. <laughs> so tell us, what is the secret? I know, I mean, from what little I know of your daughter, she is an amazing teenager to say that, you know, any teenager is, is amicable and responsible and, you know, things of that nature. Um, I think we would be hard pressed to find, especially in this day and age, um, very many, I would think. Of course, I could be wrong. I, I could be 100% wrong. I have no idea, honestly. But I, from what little I know of your daughter, she is very responsible and respectful. So what is the secret code? And how did you crack it? So just to put it into perspective, mm -hmm. she left me this note today because I, I, I worked really late last night. Yeah. And I tend to sleep into the early afternoon and then work all night. Mm -hmm. I wake up to a note from her that says, I got the mail. Your new face mask is here. I took the dog out and I'm gone to get food. Right. Should be home shortly. Smiley face. Me. <laughs> me. And then she walks in the door. We have a, we have a Jersey Mike's uh, across the street. Mm. She walks in the door with Jersey Mike's, takes my, she, has, she had my debit card that she had taken with her. She walks mm -hmm. over, she puts my, my card back in my wallet and starts setting out the food. And she's like, good morning, sleepyhead. Mm -hmm. This is my 15-year-old daughter who's going to be 16 in five days. Aw. Mm -hmm. She gets up, she handles chores. She, we share a calendar so she knows when I'm recording. Mm -hmm. She's always... She always makes sure she leaves whenever I'm going to record, mm -hmm. uh, unless I go to the studio to do the recording. Um, right. But she's just so responsible. Her room is 85 to 90 percent clean. Mm -hmm. She's an artist, so she's got clutter, but nothing's nasty, nothing's gross. Mm -hmm. um, she's always working on a project, building something in her room. <laughs> She'll open the door and ask me random questions like, should I spray paint outside? I'm like, De definitely outside. What <laughs> yeah. the hell are you doing? And she'll just have like stuff all over her face and like pin marks all over her arms. And she's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And then That's she'll walk cool. out to our balcony and spray paint something and then come back in and hang it on her wall. And uh, she's so artistic. She's so fun. It's, it's like being with, um, it's, it's like being, you know, uh, with an adult roommate mm -hmm. who just handles her stuff and um, just gets it. And uh, Which, I again, think is not normal for regular teenagers. No. I don't think from no. what I understand. Yeah, she, <laughs> she doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke anything. She's not mm -hmm. uh, uh, into drugs at all. And I know people are going, yeah, that's what you think. Um, right. You just have to meet her. You, you, would, you would just have to meet her to understand what I'm talking about. Um, 
And here's what I think the secret is. You know, and I, by the way, I plan on, I've never spoken publicly about this and I plan on making notes, putting this into an outline and literally writing a book about this. Um, mm-hmm. Cause I've done a lot of stand-up comedy about it and it, it really hits home with a lot of people, but I've had tons of people reach out. Like my, I do not have that kind of relationship with my kid or my kid's always doing this or that. And how did you do this? How did you raise your daughter? Why is she so awesome? Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. If you think about a job that you've had before, right? Where you go to work every day and, and there's somebody else that you work with in a different department that is always making your job harder, right? Mm -hmm. There's always doing something stupid that you're like, oh, they did this thing again and they didn't, you know, whatever it is. Whoever, Mm -hmm. I know that someone can put pieces together in their head about a situation like that. Right. Or, or as another example, let's say you work and you're, you're a cashier at a, at a grocery store and people are always doing stuff that like so, so they, 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 they put up half the produce and then they put boxes and then they put more produce and then they put something really like an ice cream thing next to a bag of chips. And you're like, I can't put those in the same bag. Right. So you're making it difficult for me to do my job. when if you put all the produce together and then all the heavy bulky stuff together and then all the light stuff together, that makes it really easy to bag. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't think about those things until you're in that position. Mm-hmm. Okay. So once you are made to work at the cash register, you have a whole new respect for what those folks go through in their jobs, right? If you were ever to have to switch places with that person at your job in the other department, let's say they go on vacation for a week and their boss asks you to cover for them. When they come back, you're going to work so much better together because you now understand a little taste of what it's like to be them, right? It's that, it's that idea of of walking a mile in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I came up with this idea early on. What if I taught my daughter from a very early age how to be a parent? What if I, from the, from the time I can speak with her, mm-hmm. I start sharing with her the challenges that I have as a parent and seeing what she thinks about how to solve the problem? Mm. So the dangers there are a lot of parents are like, well, if I show that weakness, the kid's going to think I'm not in control and then just take over. Huh. And, and this isn't, this isn't based out of nowhere. I mean, my, my five and a half years uh, of, of, of college, uh, uh, the vast majority was in psychology of which child and adolescent development was a part of it. So I was able to apply some basic teachings of this, but I've never heard anyone actually try this in a real setting. And I did. And so your your kid your kids seeing you as a human being is not a bad thing mm-hmm. them seeing you as someone who can make mistakes is not a bad thing it's what you do with that situation that shapes the child so being able to apologize to your kid when you get upset you send them to their room and the second they're gone you're like damn it i'm actually mad about something else and i just didn't want to deal with that and I snapped at them. So many parents will not go apologize to their kid because mm. they don't want to change that shift, that power dynamic. Yeah. But that's not what you'll do. What you'll do is set a positive example mm-hmm. of how to apologize when you're out of line. Right. And so my few basic rules were apologize to my kid, mm-hmm. teach her how to be a parent and understand that my number one job as a father is to teach my child how to live without me. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we want. At the end of the day, at the end of the life, right? If you're laying on your deathbed, you do not want your child to be saying, mommy, please don't go, I need you. Exactly. At 35, 45, 55 years old. You don't want them saying, don't go, I I need you. Mm -hmm. I want my daughter to kiss me on the forehead and go, dad, just let go. You know, I'm fine. Right. I want to be able to relax and just deuces. I just want to peace out whenever it hurts and I I can just go. Right. I don't want to feel that. I don't want to feel like I'm letting my daughter down and she's reaching out. That's the worst feeling a parent could possibly have is being helpless and going away from your child as they're needing you. So these parents 
who helicopter in and constantly save the day, who stay sort of monitor and control their kids as teenagers. Let me check your phone. Let me go through your Snapchat. Let me check your pictures. Who are you talking to? Who is this person? And, and, and sneaking up on them and reading their diary and, and monitoring their Facebook post and becoming friends under an anonymous name. And try. it's just, you become an occupying force in your child's life and you're making everything about their life difficult. Yeah. And they don't understand why. Why do you want to know their Snapchat? The truth is you want to know if they're doing drugs or having sex. Mm-hmm. Well, what do those have in common? It's about their safety. Yeah. You don't mind if, they, if your 16-year-old daughter kisses a boy necessarily. It's not necessarily that you know they're going to experiment, or, but you don't want her to be in danger. You don't want her to get some sort of disease or, or do drugs or be taken advantage of or put in a situation where she may be sexually assaulted. Mm-hmm. So instead of creeping around them and it's my house, it's my rules, and because I said so, and give me your phone, the child doesn't understand why you're, you are that occupying force. Mm-hmm. But if you teach them how hard it is to be a parent and what is at the core of your concerns, you not only make them understand why you're asking some of the questions you're asking, but you help them to make better decisions in the future. So like I would set my daughter down and I would say, uh, I want, I want to watch this, um, this 16 minute YouTube video on the dangers of vaping. She's Mm -hmm. like 14. And so we sit down and we're watching it and I won't let her have her phone there because I don't want her getting text and looking down and being distracted. I just put the phone to the side and let's just watch this for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I keep a whiteboard handy by the way. It's one of my big teaching tools because another rule I would say is everything is a teaching moment. Mm -hmm. Everything, which is why I love the name of your podcast, by the way. Thank you. Everything is a teachable moment because we'll be sitting here watching Shark Tank Mm -hmm. and they'll say, well, I've got you, uh, I, I, you know, um, you, you can have uh, 10% of the company for $100,000. I would pause the TV. And I would look at her and I'd say, if 10% of the company is worth $100,000, what's the total company valuation? She's like, well, what does that mean? Well, if 10% is worth $100,000, what is the whole company worth? If it's only 10%. And we would get on the whiteboard and break down the math. And she'd be like, oh. And then she got to where she wanted to start doing it in her head. And I would do it on my calculator. And she she would get really close doing it in her head, even on some of the more complicated ones. But it made it kind of fun. And I didn't shut down the whole show. I didn't turn everything into homework. It would be a pause. What's the value? What's the valuation? And she'd be like quarter million. And I'd unpause and we'd go back to watching the show. Right. Um, Don't be afraid to break things down and have those teachable moments. Don't be afraid to get out a sheet of paper and write stuff out to teach life lessons. Don't be afraid to walk over to the whiteboard and say, give me five minutes. I'm going to explain the structure of a pyramid scheme and show you what happens and how people lose their money. Mm -hmm. And that's really what you are. You're a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I would set her down and we would watch these, you know, YouTube videos on, on vaping and the dangers of it. Mm -hmm. And she would start asking questions. She'd be like, Oh, so even though it's not cigarette smoke, it's still vapor. And I'm like, yeah, think about what drowning is. It's a liquid going into your lungs. This is just basically like steam or something that's going to be, it, it's, it's liquid. liquid vapor that's going into your lungs. And she's like, God, that's, she's like, that's misleading. It's basically like slowly drowning. hundred like, percent. Exactly. So the, on her own through showing, exposing her to information and allowing her to ask questions, instead of me saying, I catch your ass vaping, you're losing. Right. You're not, you're not doing her any good except making her afraid of you. Mm-hmm. But if you set them down and show them the dangers of it and then say that I would always try to work a question like this and we would be watching that video and I would go, what would you do if you caught your kid vaping? Then she would have to think about what it would be like to be a parent who is responsible for a teenager mm-hmm. who is putting something harmful into their body. And now she knows what it's like to be me. Yeah. And so she never vaped. Right. Yeah. So that's one example of multiple things that we've done together throughout her life to where she now understands my goals is to keep her safe. Mm -hmm. I've always told her, I will, I will always give you freedom. And I want to get into that in a second and I'll let you ask more questions. I promise. But but I, I, 
I want to get into freedom in just a moment, but mm-hmm. I've always told her, I'll give you as much freedom as you want until you force me to restrict them. Mm-hmm. That's it. And if you make decisions that keep yourself out of danger and keep you happy and safe, I will have no reason to restrict your freedoms. Right. And so far, it's, it hasn't happened. Right. She's just been about just as much as a perfect teenager as you could possibly imagine. Well, that makes me feel hopeful for mine because I, of course, I always, you know, wonder if I'm mucking up somewhere or something with my kids. But um, I, I have always gone by the philosophy that one, I want them to be able to grow up and be independent and not need me. Like as soon as they hit 18, I mean, they might call me for a couple questions here and there, but I I don't want them to have to need me or rely on me in any way, shape or form. Um, But in doing that, I have adopted the philosophy that I should probably teach them as if they're adults from like birth basically. And I mean, obviously not. It's to me, it's just, you're teaching them how to think. That's the only thing that basically I feel like I have to do is to teach them how to think. So when we're watching something, you know, like a YouTube video or whatever, I just have to ask them questions and they can come to the conclusion on their their own, just like you did. Or, you know, they can ask me questions and I can clarify and specify if need be. But um, yeah, I mean, just open conversations and and education in general. You know, when we went to school, um, sex education for me personally only came from school. My mom kind of sort of tried to go into it one time actually no three times technically and the first time was just hey do you know what happens to your body whenever you hit like 10 11 12 years old somewhere in there and I'm like yep cool got it thanks bye I didn't have it by the way no idea what she was talking about I thought she was trying to go into a sex conversation and that's not the conversation she was trying to have and (laughs) I didn't want to have the sex conversation at 10, 11, 12 years old. And um, then, you know, later on, she was like, anytime you want to talk about, you know, having sex or anything like that, I'm an open door. You can always come to me and talk to it, to me about it. Well, the one time I tried to talk to her about it, I was 14. No, I was 15 at the time. And I said, Hey, how would you feel about me having sex? And she immediately just got mad and was like, well, I'll tell you one thing. You'd be the youngest person in our family to lose it at this age. And I was like, cool. So guess we're not talking about sex then. So (laughs) so you immediately felt judged. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And by the way, I had already lost my virginity, which she didn't know at the time. So I was like, yeah, we're definitely not, you're not an open door. We're not having this conversation. Right. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And that's what they say. Actions speak louder than words. Exactly. Gotta actually be there. Yeah. They have to actually be there for the kid. That's I told her that story later on because she didn't, I never told her during that time, of course, that I had already had sex when I tried to have that conversation with her. And as soon as I told her that she felt, uh, she felt so bad. And I didn't, I didn't realize that she was going to feel bad. I should have, of course, obviously as a mother myself, I should have understood that she would a hundred percent have felt bad and probably not told her that. But regardless, if you (laughs) think about even from the time they're they're really tiny from the time they're one or two, Mm -hmm all the way up until they're 30 or 40, what hurts them the most? It's always ignorance. Mm-hmm. They just didn't know something, right? Exactly. They didn't realize that that was going to hurt. Kids who have accidents with guns, same way. They, they, the parent allows access somehow to a firearm. The kid has never played with it, but it's always been intriguing. The kid gets the gun and then disaster, right? There's always something that is just, terrible that can happen to someone the same thing with a fork in the in the in a socket mm-hmm. I, look i at three years old i sat my daughter down at a restaurant mm-hmm. she had ordered a, a little kid's uh steak thingy and i i got a, a steak knife and i showed her how to cut her steak mm-hmm. at three Now, a lot of people are thinking that's way too early. That's way too young. Listen, I've always looked at my kid, just like you said, I've always looked at my kid as um, a human being, an adult who just Mm -hmm. knows less stuff. Right. And I just got to fill in the gaps along Mm -hmm. the way. And sometimes it'll be so cute. You'll, you'll, You'll think they're growing up. They'll be super responsible on all the things you've taught them. And then they'll ask you the cutest question in the world that you'll realize is a massive blind spot because it's just something you've never addressed. 
Right. And it's like, like with, with my daughter, she's so smart and she's so fun and she's a good kid and she cleans up and she takes care of the dog and she'll remind me to take the dog to the groom and she'll go get food and she'll handle all of the things she's supposed to handle and she'll do her live lessons in her remote uh, online school and she'll, like, she'll just text me, I finished this, I finished this, can I stay the night with my friend? And I'm like, sure. And, and then randomly she looked at me the other day and she goes, dad, how much is college? <laughs> And I just laughed so hard because I was like, oh, you sweet little thing. Like, right. <laughs> like, like she expected me to be like, it's, you know, it's a thousand dollars. Like there's a price to college. Exactly. <laughs> it's a very adorable question from someone who I treat as an adult on a regular basis. Yeah. But I told her, she laughed at this. I told her, I walked over and I picked up a fan and I was like, it's so funny doing this with you. And I explained to her why I enjoyed it because I said, sometimes you're just so on, on point with everything as an adult. And then I said, then you just walk up to a thing in the living room. And I go, I picked right. up the fan and I just went, daddy, what's this one? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and she just busted out laughing. And I'm like, that's kind of what it is. You just blindside me sometimes with some stuff that you're missing. I was exactly. like, so, and I immediately went, well, let's talk about it. And um, we went to a couple of college websites uh, that she's interested in. And we just started breaking down what it means. Like, do you want to, is it tuition and books? Are you just going to, you're going to go to a community college to get basics? Are you going to do, are you going to live on campus and play room and and pay, uh, pay for the dorm or whatever? Mm. And she's like, oh, so I get to decide kind of how much. And I was like, yeah, how much you like, you want to stay here and go? Or do you want to, she's like, oh, I definitely want to go. And I'm like, okay. And so, and so uh, being able to expose her to things that she needs to know, being able to expose her to things that could potentially hurt her, like Mm -hmm. the steak knife. I mean, by the time she was four and a half, she would just grab a knife and start cutting her steak. She'd been doing it for a year and a half. Like what 40 year old is comfortable with a steak knife? Now, to be fair, I did take the knife out of the uh, napkin and I showed her the the serrated edges. I said, look at that. That can really hurt you. Mm -hmm. I poked poked it on my skin and then I did it on her skin. I said, Mm -hmm. see if you poke it, it's sharp. And she's like, Oh, but that doesn't hurt. I said, no, but if you slide it like this and I showed her to slide across the steak, it cuts it immediately. She goes, <sighs> she kind of grabbed her arm like, Ooh, cause I did it on the steak and she envisioned that happening to her arm. Of course. So you got to keep your fingers out of the way. Cause that's going to happen to your fingers. And she's like, Oh, I won't do that. Daddy. I go, okay. Right. And now what's that? It's 30 seconds, maybe exactly of, of a teaching moment. And now this kid fully understands. And you know what? I gotta be honest. If she's if she's cutting a steak at a steak uh, at a steakhouse, and she cuts her finger open, it's not the end of the world. It, no, it's a slice on the finger, and it sucks. And now she knows. I mean, I'm not saying let her do it, and she never did, but no. exposing them to things that could be dangerous and teaching them how to responsibly operate in that realm is how you teach them to live without you. Mm-hmm. I don't know. No, exactly that. Um... When I was in middle school, I had an experience um, where I was trying to tell my friends something that I thought was wrong um, because I didn't really 100% understand it at all. Um, But when I told my friends what I thought was wrong, I didn't really, I guess I didn't really express greatly that I thought that something might actually be wrong. I think that they thought I was just like gossiping to them or something. And they went and like spread the whole thing around the school and it wound up being just like a really, really, really terrible situation. Um, Whereas had I have gone to an adult or something like that, whom I felt comfortable talking about something like that with, then it would have not turned into that obviously. And something would have been done because it was a wrong situation. Um, And I just didn't know what to do. And so now I, I, because my, son is 13 and he has, you know, social media and, and his own phone and his own computer now and things like that. I impress upon him greatly. Like the, the only reason I would ever, ever, ever feel a need to go through your phone is strictly for a safety concern whatsoever. Like, and, and by safety concern, by the way, I also mean you can say things or have things happen Um, in a conversation that could potentially be or wind up being um, a non-safe situation for either you or the person in the conversation that you're having it with, whatever the case may be. But I need you to know that if you ever have an issue where you're, you're questioning whether something's wrong or not, 
period, you need to come to me with it and we need to figure it out together because it's just about safety for you and everybody involved. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And every, every kid's going to be different. You know, some yeah. kids have really high resilience. Some have low resilience. Some don't pay attention to details. Others have attention deficit disorder. Others are um, highly sensitive to uh, controlling. Others don't care either way. Yeah, exactly. It's going to depend. And, and my daughter is a lot like me genetically. She's kind of my replica of a human. Um, and so, uh, it's easier for me to operate in that way because I understand what would have been better for me as a kid. And that works. The problem is sometimes, you know, your kid may be more like your spouse and the same problems you have in your marriage, you may have talking with your child. So, uh, I totally get that. And, um, in, in my situation, it was better for me to explain to her some of the dangers, Mm -hmm. but there have been times where we've been sitting at the table and she'll be texting someone or talking and she'll laugh and I'll go, Oh, what's going on? And she'll say, Oh, this guy messaged me. And I'll go, what guy? And she'll go, Oh, he was my Uber driver. And I go, uh, what? And she'll go, Oh no, 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 it's not like that. It was on Snapchat and Instagram. And I followed him because he's a DJ and I'm like, okay, listen, Mm -hmm. um, he's like 19. Of course. Uh, I'm not cool with this. She goes, Oh, I just thought I was following for his music. And I said, well, you may be seeing it that way, but not be, Exactly. And, um, it's probably safe that you distance yourself from things like that. And she goes, oh, I didn't even think about that. I'll go delete him right now. It's not a big deal. And she went in and deleted him. Um, the, the, the problems you have is if you don't have an open communication with your mm-hmm. kids, um, then you may feel the need to control them more because you don't trust what they say. Yeah. And in my situation, and I have to say, I think parents often start the distrust. Oh yeah, totally. and they don't even realize it. I mean, yeah. I, this this show isn't for kids. So if you're listening with your young kid, you may want to stop now. I'm not going to curse or anything, but I'm going to say something. Okay, I can spoil something for I don't know eight or nine year olds, seven year olds maybe. Ah, gotcha. So there's your there's your warning. So yeah, um, we so many parents lie to our kids so often. Mm-hmm. We lie to them about Santa Claus. We lie to them about the Easter bunny. We Mm -hmm. lie to them about the tooth fairy. And then we are shocked when they come home at 12 years old and lie to us about getting in trouble at school. Yeah. Kids. I've always been torn about that. Kids don't follow examples. I'm sorry. Kids don't follow rules. They follow examples. Yeah. And so you you throwing your things all around the house and then telling them to clean their room isn't going to work. Right. If your kid's room is in shambles, check your ego for a minute and turn around and look at your room. Look at your kitchen. Look at your living room. Mm-hmm. You, quite often, if it's, if it's super clean, your kid's room will typically be clean. Now, there are always exceptions to the rule. There are kids that just don't care and don't want to do anything about it. But it's about instilling the values, not demanding the, the, the compliance. Right. And so many parents demand compliance rather than instilling values. Yeah. hundred percent. And so with my daughter, I never lied to her about any of that stuff. Mm. I would, and some, some parents disagreed with me on this, Of course. but I found a way to pretend without her thinking that I actually believed it. Mm-hmm. And I would say, I would tell the story of Santa Claus and I would say, People say that there's a guy who can fit down the chimney, but I don't know. It seems kind of weird. What do you think? Let's go look up. And we would look up the chimney and she's like, I don't know. I don't think so, daddy. And I'm like, I don't know. They say he can. I guess we'll have to see. And I talk about it in a way to make her skeptical. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And the whole time I'm sort of hinting at it not being real, Mm -hmm. but playing with the idea that it could be and how fun would it be if this thing existed. Right. Christmas morning, she wakes up and there's all these presents and it says from Santa. Mm -hmm. And she's like, "Mm, you did this. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe, or maybe that guy came down the chimney. How do you ever know? She's like, daddy. I'm like, I don't know, maybe. And (laughs) it just got more fun. Yeah. To the point when she's probably six or seven Mm -hmm. that she would only talk about Santa, but then give me a little wink. 
Like she's in on it with me. And how fun yeah. is that? Because you know what that means? We can do that for the rest of our lives. Mm. We never have to have that conversation. Exactly. Same as with the Easter Bunny and the same as with the Tooth Fairy. She would start hiding her teeth. Being like, yeah, let's see where this Tooth Fairy is coming from. And then the first time <laughs> we, had a, uh, we had a situation one time where she, it was like a, a Tuesday. And she goes, oh, my tooth came out and I'm so excited. She goes, dad, I'm going to give money from the tooth fairy. And she's like <laughs> looking at me like, get your money ready. And I said, I've told you before, the tooth fairy only comes on Fridays. Because um, that's when daddy gets paid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. she would laugh and then put it aside. And then on Friday, she would go put it under a pillow. And Aww. she would to hide it in places so that I would get caught trying to find it in her room. And it became this playful thing. And then if she would wake up while I was in there, I would be like, hey. She's like, I knew it. I'm like, no, no, listen. The tooth fairy was in here. She called me. She said you were snoring really loud. At be quiet. It's like, oh. And she'd turn over and go back to sleep. And then I would walk out. And so we've played like that for years. And so I never told her to believe it. She always knew I didn't believe it. But we still right. got to play and pretend. And I, so I didn't, get to, I didn't have to take her imagination away. And if you were to see her bedroom, you would clearly see that's the case. Right. Um, <laughs> but I also didn't lie to her. Yeah. And so I instilled in her that uh, telling the truth and having integrity is at the core of everything you do. But that doesn't mean you have to stifle your imagination and, and not be imaginative. Yeah. That's funny that you say that because that's now that I think back about it, that's kind of what my dad did. He'd just be like, I don't know. What do you think? And that's what I do now to my kids. I'll just be like, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. So, that's it's cool. Funny. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember though, because my mom would always like adamantly, she was adamant about it. She was like, <clears throat> she was a huge stickler for like Santa and the Easter bunny. And, um, after I figured everything out, I vaguely remember them having a conversation where she kind of like nudged him and was like, you know, don't, don't ruin it type thing. Um, and so, because I knew that my dad would always tell me the truth. If I blatantly said, Hey, I need you to tell me the truth in this moment. I literally like seven or eight years old came out of my room one day randomly and just sat down in front of them and I was like I really need you to tell me the truth here is Santa real and he was like oh, no. yeah I did and he, he hesitated for a long minute but finally he was just like no and I was like thank you and I walked away <laughs> and that was it. horrible because in his world he was it was the furthest thing from his mind but oh you yeah you could tell you had really been thinking about this. Like this was important. Like dad. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And that was probably like the most serious I had ever been with him as a child. And yeah, I, I can't imagine it not being just hilarious. He was very good at keeping a straight face most of the time. <laughs> Mine was, I started, um, I started being a little investigator. I was a skeptic. I started putting pieces together. My, of course. My mom, <laughs> my mom, uh, always told me about, you know, Santa coming down the chimney, but we, we lived in a, a trailer park. I was very, very poor, poor growing up. And I was like, um, you know, actually we lived in a house until I was about five. And then when they got divorced, we moved, my mom and I moved into a, a, a trailer park. And I remember my mom uh, saying, I was, I asked her one time, I was just like, well, how does Santa get into the house now? She's like, David, he comes down the chimney. I was like, we don't have a chimney. Mm -hmm. She was like, oh. Um, she goes, in, I guess you read the story somewhere. She goes, oh, in houses where uh, they don't have chimneys, there's a Christmas mouse. And the Christmas mouse opens the door for Santa. Mm. And I was like, I don't know how he could reach that. <laughs> right. I don't know if he's heavy enough to twist the knob. And Yeah. I was like, hmm, all right. It's like a MacGyver mouse. <laughs> she, by the way, mm -hmm. terrified of mice. Mm -hmm. And I knew this about her. Mm -hmm. So uh, about, I would say, five, six months later, uh, we ended up having a mouse in, mm -hmm. our, in, our, in our house. And she buys these traps. And one day, it just pop, and the mouse is dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I got her. Like, I'm not, I'm not freaking out. I'm not upset, but I'm like, there's no way she can get out of this one. And so I walk up and she's like freaking out by having to move the dead mouse. And I was like, I pretended to be sad about it. I was like, mom, you killed the Christmas mouse. How is Santa going to get in? 
I was like, oh, I'm screwed now. There's no point <laughs> in even being good. No, right? <laughs> yeah. And then she sits me down. And she's like, okay, listen, you little shit. Here's the deal. And so she tells me about Santa. She tells me about the Easter Bunny. She tells me about uh, the Tooth Fairy. And then I went, oh, so the same is true for Jesus, right? She's like, oh, no. no. I'm like, yeah. Right. Well, you can wait till I'm like 13 and tell me that one was all a lie. She's like, no, David. No, absolutely not. I'm like, yeah, mm. that sounds kind of the same, mom. Never mm. seen them. They have all these magical powers. I'm not really buying this. Mm. And that started a whole new can of worms. You can check that out at davidcsmaller.com. <laughs> <laughs> a lifetime of worms. A lifetime of worms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh when when we lived in a house, my mom told me that uh they just like magically opened up uh, a pretend um chimney that he could come through just to deliver the presents and then it would magically go away whenever they went away. That was her story. Mm. Well, mm. that honestly, if you're going to if you're going to come into Santa's magic, I guess that makes sense. Right? I mean, he's got all the magic, you know, he's Santa. Yeah. yeah. What's just Spend reality to that point, nothing else matters. Which exactly, which I've also found true in my podcast over the years. Of course, you have. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned freedom earlier. So, what what do you think about that? Yeah, so that gives away the answer to all the questions I'm going to ask you. <laughs> but think about it like this: think about the best things that can happen to a human being um hitting the lottery or becoming rich in some way traveling uh going on vacation not having to work for a living um all think about what all those things have in common freedom you're you're free you don't have to go to work in the morning you don't have to set an alarm you're free to wake up whenever you want you're free to travel now think about the worst things that can happen to a human. Um, mm -hmm. Being bedridden out of an illness, um, drowning, uh, being trapped in a fire, being kidnapped, held against your will, being put in prison. Uh, when we hear about the attacks that happen, someone, someone's handcuffed to a, a bed for four years and starved and being poor, having limited resources, being stuck in a job that you hate and, and can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. And what do all those things have in common? Not freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. this, this thought experiment has led me to conclude that the, the human purpose is freedom. It's all we ever want. Even if you go somewhere where you want to be, and Jerry Seinfeld touches on this in his latest special, he's like, we always got to get the hell out of there. Like, we got to go. We got to go. We got to get out. of. We got to leave home. We got to get on the train. And then it's, I got to get the hell off this train. And then it's once we're in the theater, it's like, this is good. We're here for a minute. And we always want to go out. We want to go. We want to go out. And then we get to the theater and we watch the comedian. And then we're like, we got to get the hell out of here. We got to get home. We got to get back home. And then we get home. I got to get to work. When we get mm -hmm. to work, I can't wait to get back to the house. And then when you get on vacation, it's like, we got to get, we got to get out of this town. And then you're on vacation for four days. You're like, I got to get the hell out of here. We got to get back home. Mm -hmm. It's suffering. And, and freedom is at the core of everything that humans strive for as a purpose. And so if you're in a relationship as an adult with someone who restricts your freedoms, or is standing in between something that you want, mm -hmm. you will fill that gap with resentment. Right. If that person goes, oh, please don't go get your degree yet. I'm working on this project for this thing and, or wait till the kids finish high school and wait till, and you're having to put your life on hold. You are going to fill that gap with resentment. The same happens with teenagers, with children. Yeah. The more you restrict their freedoms, the more they are going to resent you for being what stands between them and the thing they desire. Mm -hmm. And so I've explained to my daughter from a very early age that I want to provide her freedoms and provide her opportunities. And I will only restrict them when she forces me to meaning 
if you don't answer the phone and don't respond to my text and I can't find you, you're not going to go out for a few days because now it's a safety concern. Mm -hmm. if you're responsive and you're honest with me, you will be able to do anything you want to do. But if I find out that you've lied to me, that breaks all the trust we've built over the last 15 years. And now I've got to start over. And mm -hmm. my mom always told me that trust is the easiest thing to lose and the hardest thing to get back. Yeah, and I've taken true. that lesson and instilled that to my daughter. And I go, we've got a lot of trust. The difference in, in me and my mom is I will give my daughter an opportunity to explain. Mm -hmm. My mom would get mad. It was shut the hell up. I told you to do it. You didn't do it. Get out of my face. And with my daughter, I'll go, that's not what we talked about. And she'll say, dad, I know, but here's what happened. And mm -hmm. there's almost always a, 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 a sensible explanation, right. right? Some sort of rational explanation to where I'm like, oh, that's the one thing I didn't think of, you know? Right, of course. I'll go, okay, I'm sorry I got upset, but you understand where I was coming from. And she'll go, oh, I totally get it. I should have told you ahead of time and I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're able to build that communication and, and keep that open line. I don't want to restrict her freedoms. No. Because what parents don't realize is when you restrict your child's freedoms, you're also restricting your own. Right. If you don't let your kids go out, you're there managing their every move. Yeah. You're creating someone to supervise. So teaching your kid to make good decisions and allowing them to keep their freedoms by staying safe and knowing what it's like to be a parent, they then understand what it's like to put you through hell and they don't want you to suffer. So in order to minimize your suffering, they will reduce their negative behavior. That's what's worked for me. And I think one of the biggest mistakes parents make is saying, because I said so. Oh, I hate that. I, I always hated that as a kid. It me made too. me so mad. I know, me too. And <laughs> what, what happens when you do that mm -hmm. is you're, you're, you're wasting a teachable opportunity. Exactly. To help that child make a better decision in the future. Right. The why may sound like a challenge or I don't, I don't want uh, anything, you know, I, I don't want you in my business right now. But what's really happening is they're saying they want to know why, because this may come up in the future and they want to know how to address it differently so that it can be a yes instead of a no. Mm -hmm. So my daughter says, hey, can I go out with my friends to the mall? And I say, no. Why? Because I said so. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know that it's because... Uh, you know, it's too late or the mall closes in only an hour or I can't drive her there because my toe hurts or whatever the random reason could be. But if I give right. her the reason and I go, well, the mall closes at six on Sundays and it's 430 and I don't want to have to worry where you are in an hour and a half. Yeah. So next well, time ask me sooner. Oh, and then the next day it's and the next Sunday. It's 1:30 PM. Can I go to the mall? Sure. Now there's time for you to be spending at the mall without me worrying. Be home at, at six when the mall closes. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's giving them an opportunity to make better decisions in the future. So anyone who says, because I said so, please know that you're just wasting a teachable moment. Right. Yeah. My, um, and my thing is with that too, is that it generally for me, it takes less time for me to just explain the why than it does for me to argue back and forth of, well, that doesn't make sense. Yes, I know it doesn't make sense, but it's because I said so at this moment. And, but why that makes me angry type thing. Like it just, it takes two sentences essentially to explain why, and then be like, okay, cool or not whatever. But it, generally takes less just just less time which i'm always a, a big fan of saving time especially in communication so it just takes less time to explain the why than it does to argue about it and be angry about it and whatnot and so forth yeah, and if you explain that and they make better decisions in the future mm -hmm. you then don't have to do it dominate. again you don't have to argue you don't have to have the conversation again Exactly. Have the screaming matches or the, the, the disobedience and all the other stuff and then the fights and you just keep wanting to dominate. I said so. Take, take your phone off. Put your phone on. Leave this damn door open. Who are you talking to? It becomes a, you become just this, this tyrannical maniac in your own house when if you just teach them to make better decisions, you don't have that worry and your, your child is someone to enjoy and enjoy to spend time with and be honest with rather than... Mm -hmm fight constantly and it's a it's a wonderful feeling yeah i concur so just real quick is that kind of the tyrannical how you grew up um i know you don't like you don't have to 
go into great detail. No, no, no. no. My mom was great. Um, not really. It, it was my mom came from a, a generation where kids just stayed in their damn room. Like you, you, know, you and I, I don't think we're really in the same generation. I think you're quite a bit younger. So uh, you're probably closer to, I don't know, you're kind of in between in mm-hmm. where I am and where my daughter is. Um, my mom just grew up, like her parents, my mom grew up in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. So her, it was always, the kids had nothing to do with the party. Like kids, your job was to be invisible. 100%, yeah. Um, and then, so when I grew up, there was still a lot of that going on, but we were trying to crack the the shell of that. I was definitely forced to go play with a lot of kids I didn't want to be a part of. Right. Um, and so for the most part, I just kept to myself. I did my own thing and I would interact with my mom uh, occasionally, uh, like in the, in, in the house, we would cross paths. And as I got older, we spent more time together. You know, we would like slap box and watch sitcoms together. Everybody loves Raymond and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, we would have fun and, and, and hang out. But for the most part, she had her adult life and I had my child life and the two never intertwined. My relationship with my daughter is the first time in my, in my family where it's been sort of a damn near a co-equal partnership where people are living together in, 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 in harmony and both are respected. You know, it's mm-hmm. never, it's never been like that in my family. The, the adult was just because you're older, you got the respect and the kids shut the mouth. And I never wanted to raise my daughter, my daughter that way. Yeah, me neither. Have you ever heard of love and logic parenting? It's yep. pus. <laughs> I did not expect that big of a sigh. You want to explain that? Well, my problem with love and logic is their basis with all of the faith stuff that they intertwine into their teachings. Oh, okay. Well, I wasn't aware of that part of it. Oh yeah. It's bad. Um, they have a lot of good teachings, um, mm-hmm. but a lot of times they will like, they tend to, it's one of those things that is so good and so positive on many respects. Mm-hmm. But sometimes the foundation of why they're teaching what they're teaching is so corrupt and is so shaky. So it's one of those things where I like to start with a solid foundation and work my way up to the same result that love and logic may get to Mm -hmm. love and logic. A lot of times at the end of their, um, at the end of their, or at the core of their message is, is a really shaky, uh, shaky ground. And they've had to walk back some of their statements. They've had to lighten up on some of their corporal punishment sort of ideas. And yeah. Um, there's been some issues with it. It's not a perfect book, a, a series of books. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff in it. So I'm sure you were going to quote the good stuff. And, but I, I just, I, I tend to stay away from them uh, because of some of the, the poison that that's in those books. Of course. So no, I, I have only watched videos. A psychologist introduced uh, a series of videos that she had to me Um none of which mentioned any sort of faith-based anything. They were just literally, I mean, black and white parenting, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought that that would be something that you had learned in the parenting class that they made you take whenever you got divorced. Was that not? It was. And not only that, but I I read um, some of the Love and Logic um, parenting books as part of my college in child and adolescent development. So Mm -hmm. I had already been exposed to that before I'd gotten divorced when I was in college. I got you. So it was at this point that David and I heard noises in the background that I cannot edit out, unfortunately, and I had to pause to go take care of it. And so there's a gap here that sounds weird, just so everybody knows, but um, I wanted to take this moment just to also let you guys know that you guys can check out our Patreons, both of us. His will be at patreon.com slash David C. Smalley. And then mine is going to be patreon.com slash the teachable soul. You can go and see updates there sometimes and support us as well. And also please feel free to check us out on social media, anywhere, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, David C. Smalley with an EY or the teachable soul. Thank you. Okay. So, um, we talked about love and logic parenting. Um, and freedom. I mean, I think, have you, have you covered all the, the, the bullet points? Oh, I was just going off my head. Yeah. I didn't bring any bullet points, but I think so. 
Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think that it just, it generally comes down to treat your kids as if they're just less educated adults, essentially, that you just have to fill in the gaps for. And, you know, especially for teenagers, freedom is a huge deal. I agree. Yeah. And, and teaching them how to do your job as a parent mm-hmm. will not only help them be better kids, it will help them be better parents when they become parents. Yeah. And teaching them how to live without you takes pressure off of you as an adult and allows you to have some sense of life after, like once you're an empty nester, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. we all want to be wanted. We all want to be needed. But some of us create this codependence this codependency with our kids like there are people i know in their late 20s or early 30s who will literally call their mothers for everything anything that goes wrong they're calling mom they're calling mom they're calling mom and and i'm sure the mom on one hand appreciates the need Mm -hmm. on another hand is like if i die you're screwed like what are you gonna do with your life you know and so um this even goes back to me making my daughter order for herself at restaurants. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I would make her call. Like She would say, Dad, we want pizza. She'd have a bunch of friends over, and she's like nine. She'd go, Dad, we want to order pizza. And I'll go, okay, order it. Here's my debit card. Mm-hmm. She's like, what? I don't know what to say. Well, call them and tell them you want a pizza. Right. What? Tell them what you want on it. Tell them what you want. Don't ask you questions. And <laughs> the first time she did it, he comes flying out. And she goes, Dad, what's our zip code? <laughs> And I said, here's another funny thing, because I'm not a person of faith. I always had my daughter recite our address and phone number every night before she went to bed. Mm -hmm. Um, In case she ever got lost or was out somewhere. So still to this day, she can tell you the full address and the phone number to both me and her mother. Of course. Um, And she rattled off the zip code as part of the address every night. Mm -hmm. We'd never called it zip code. We just did the whole thing together. Right. (laughs) And our area code at the time uh, was 817 in that area of, of the Dallas Fort Worth area. Mm-hmm. And she comes running out of her room and she goes, she goes, dad, what's our zip code? And I said, what? She goes, I told them 817 like five times. And they said, that's not enough numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and I could hear the person on the phone laughing. Like the person at Domino's was just dying laughing. Right. And I said, you know, those last five numbers you say on the address, at night and then she rattled it off and I said that's the zip code and she's like oh and she went back in her room and shut the door and I know that panic <laughs> of being asked a question as a nine-year-old on the phone and she was yeah. already nervous but forcing her to go through that and not helping her not like saving the day and taking the phone and finishing the order yeah challenging her in the moment of her crisis to be like what are the you know the zip code it's the last five numbers you say in our address and then she rattles it off she found the answer on her own and went back and finished the call Every call after that got easier. Of course. And the people at Domino's got used to hearing her phone call. And uh, <laughs> she would have a movie night or a, uh, she would call, you know, to have stuff delivered for one of her friends down the street. And it would be the same Domino's. What that did is it opened her up to building her own self-confidence and talking with adults. Yeah. And being able oh, to boy. express her opinions and being able to open up and say, uh, I disagree with that. And I challenge authority, but do so respectfully. That's another thing I've always taught her. And Same, yeah. I can't do that if I don't, uh, if I'm not okay with being challenged. Yeah, exactly. You know, I have to be okay with being some of that authority that she challenges it. If she does everything I say, exactly how I say it without question, she is a robot. That's yeah. Not the perfect kid. The perfect kid will push back. Mm-hmm. Doing so with a level of respect and she's a teenager. So sometimes she does get the attitude. And when she does, instead of me getting mad about it, I will, sometimes I'll start laughing at her Mm -hmm. and then she starts laughing and she's like, what? And I'm like, I'll just be like, you said that so shitty to me. (laughs) And she'll go, I'm sorry, dad. I'm just, I was on the phone with somebody and they really made me mad. And I'm like, okay, well that's called deferred anger. You're deferring it to me when that person deserves it. So go cuss them out. Leave me. (laughs) Because I'm just asking you a question. And then we laugh about it. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's important to point out when they act that way or say, hey. And she's, ha- she's upset me before with it. And I'll just say, do, do you think I deserve your tone right now? Do, is that, do, do you feel like I, I walked into that? Did, did I ask for that? And she'll immediately walk it back. I don't say, don't you dare talk to me like that. Right. I'll say, do you think that's justified in what I said to you? Yeah, of course. And that's more disarming because then she thinks, God, she has to answer the question in her own head. No, it, it's not fair. 
right? right. It, doesn't, it doesn't make sense, and I shouldn't have said it that way. Um, but forcing her to call, you know, and order the pizza and order her own food at the restaurant, she'd be six or seven, and she'd point at chicken strips or chicken nuggets and go, Dad, I want this. And I'd say, I don't work here. Exactly. And then the, the person would be like, what do you want, sweetie? And she'd be like, um, I want the chicken nuggets. with." And then they, oh, you want barbecue? Or you want ketchup? Oh, I want barbecue sauce. And then she would start going, do you have sweet tea here? Do you have, do you have a, do you have a, uh, really straw with circles in it? And then they would talk to her and she, sometimes she would get stuff. Sometimes she wouldn't. Yeah. Well, she's, a, you know, she's about to be a 16 year old and she can have conversations with anybody she runs into. Yeah. And it's so inspiring. She'll go, she'll walk the dog and come home and be like, have you met Arnold? <laughs> like, oh, oh, he's the cutest basset hound. His owner is Nicholas or something. I don't know. But anyway, Arnold is three years old. He's so cute. He knows how to shake. He knows how to sit. And I'm like, okay, I mean, that's, that's, that's what we want, right? We want our kids yeah. to be social and to, to be confident in speaking with adults. And I love totally. that. Totally. Yeah, that's actually um, one of the huge mistakes that I made um, whenever my son was younger. So uh, I had my son on my 18th birthday, so I was a f- very young mother, um, and I didn't know what I was doing. And um, while my mom was helpful, she was trying to parent in her, or trying to teach me to parent basically in her style, and I hated her parenting style. And so I didn't didn't have anything else to go off of basically. And so I was just kind of winging it. But um, one of the things that came out at one point in time, whenever he was going into kindergarten was that if your kid acts shy or doesn't want to talk to other adults in any you know situation, they were like, just ignore them. And eventually they'll come around and start talking to the other person. They'll eventually want to be a part of the conversation. Well, um, yeah, that didn't happen. For my particular child, I, so now, of course, I realize I was like, wow, I should have uh, been that parent that totally lately was like forcing him to talk to other people, whether he wanted to or not, because that would have worked out more in his favor and mine in the future. But so, yeah, that's what I have to do now, basically. But at 13, he barely wants to speak two words to anybody that is an adult um, he just actually recently in the past couple of years started being able to talk to uh, kids his own age just randomly, like where we were, we were at the pool one day and he started talking to kids his own age, just, I don't know, hanging out with them or whatever. To the point one girl actually tried to give him his number, but then his mom, that her mom found out and was like, no. Oh. So. <laughs> Oh, come on, mom. I know, right? <laughs> I was like, uh, man, he really uh, needed that confidence boost, man. man. <laughs> like he's a good kid i promise he's it's not just a number what's daughter. the problem exactly right like they're not going to talk about anything but video games trust me <laughs> the boy doesn't talk about anything but video games <laughs> so yeah that, that hopefully that's something that he that he comes out of and you know of course you know there are things that like i said start making him order the pizza make him order at the drive through you know uh, I do. you can, you can kind of help him you know engage in that way with some guidance and Honestly, failing at stuff like that tends to be helpful. Yeah. Like when my daughter had that panic mode mm-hmm. of not knowing what a zip code was. Right. That was her worst fear is to be asked a question she didn't, she wasn't prepared for. Mm-hmm. And just like every stand up comedian's worst fear is bombing. Yeah. Well, guess what? You're going to. Mm-hmm. And when you do and you bomb and then you realize you didn't die. <laughs> right you're like <laughs> you're like i was always so afraid of that and i came through the other side and the people out there don't even remember like that's the point when you're terrible you're forgettable and they just right. go oh that one guy sucked and but they remember the person that they liked right and they'll just be like that one guy was terrible and that's right. fine and so then you then the next time you go on stage you're like oh i already know the worst that can happen and right. I've lived through it once. And so when you bomb a few more times, you're like, I can do this. And then when you get comfortable and relaxed, you start mm-hmm. being funny again because mm-hmm. you're not so afraid of bombing. Right. And then it almost never happens because you're so confident with it happening that as it starts to bomb or you start to not have problems, you start making fun of yourself for bombing. And then that gets funny and you can right. save the show. Right. And that's kind of the same thing that happened with her. And I think that can happen with all of them. Yeah, if I we, agree. Like, because next time she got on the phone, she wasn't so terrified because for one, she damn near, she knew the zip code mm-hmm. for sure. 
<laughs> for sure. And if she didn't, she could just laugh about it and run back out and be like, oh, was it Aria or Zip again? You know, right. and she knows she can live through it. Right. Mm-hmm. So exposing him to stuff like that and letting him have those is, is so good for his confidence. You know. Yeah, I agree. Really Every good. time we go to the gas station now, I make him go in and buy our drinks oh, and I'm like, here good. you go. Yeah. Good. And then yeah. you can be like, hey, ask him if they have this thing mm-hmm. or that thing, even if you know they don't have it, you know, just little right. things like that. Um, <laughs> like, I think so many, what? What's, what's that joke? There's like a dad joke that's like that. Hey, go in and ask for blinker fluid or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I don't mean to ask for blink fluid. Right. <laughs> try that with my daughter. Oh, you should. Oh, you oh, should yeah. film it. Please, please film it. Well, she's been enough. She's been on enough TikTok. She'd probably be like, "Yeah, I don't believe that's a thing." But I'll, I'll see if she picks up on it. I that's think she's funny. seen enough videos of people. I may have to come up with something else. That's true. Yeah. YouTube ruins it for us all nowadays. <laughs> it does. I can't tell you how many challenge, TikTok challenges I've lost money to because she's already seen the challenge. Oh, I man. You can't poke your head through this hole. Yeah, well, yeah. I bet you can't get this thing out of from under this cup. Right. She, them all. she gets them all right. So I want to start doing TikTok dances, but my kids won't dance with me. It makes me mad. <laughs> I'm, um, I am ashamed and uh, embarrassed to say that I've done one with my daughter and put it on my own TikTok. And I don't oh, care. I know. I saw it. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> that one and your beatboxing ones yeah. and the one with your mom. I'm trying to share it as many times as I can. I swear. <laughs> she's, she's not, she's so over that. I don't know. But yeah, I, so you saw me throw it back. Yeah. I did yeah. throw it back. Indeed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You should do more. <laughs> <sighs> All right, fine. If the, fan, if the fan base needs it, I guess. Right? I'll, I'll say <laughs> back do. by popular demand, which means one person said they won't see another video. The uh, fourth listener, see, bro. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you should see the video. We actually took video of my daughter teaching me that dance. Oh, really? That's, that's the fun part. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Because I did yeah, not understand me. what the hell was going on. <laughs> I, may, I may release it somewhere. It's way longer than TikTok will allow. but Of course. Yeah. Well, you, uh, you do, you did good on it. Like you and her were very synchronized. It was very good. I had a good teacher. I appreciate yeah, it. I had a right? good teacher. She's, a, mm. she was actually a dance instructor for her first job. Aw. She's a really talented dancer. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Have we fixed all the problems today? I think we fixed all of the parenting the, problems. The parenting problems. Yes. Next we'll work on, on philosophy and religion some other day. On so your podcast, the, maybe. <laughs> let's do it. I do just want to draw a parallel real quick before we go. Yeah, please. When I was talking about the parenting by, with love and examples and teaching them why you're making your decisions as opposed to just dominating as an occupying force. Mm-hmm. And then when you dominate as an occupying force, they then respond with their own anger and lashing out because they're trying to find their own identity. Mm-hmm. This same concept can be applied to what's going on in society right now. Mm. It's the right? exact same thing. When Bro, we're going to be here for like five more hours. That's not <laughs> the, I'm just saying, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's a human oh, condition. Oh, I have. It's a human condition to not want to be controlled yep. and to not be threatened. So... Mm-hmm. If, if my daughter gives me attitude and I respond by standing up and bowing my chest out and yelling at her, mm-hmm. she's either going to cower or lash out. Mm-hmm. It's not going to resolve anything. No, of course. And the same is true for protesters. Yeah. When protesters show up and scream things at the police because they're upset. Yeah. If the police say, I hear you and I know that you're mad and let's take a knee together. Yeah. The violence doesn't break out. Nope. Exactly. But when the police stand there with riot shields and helmets and mm-hmm. get into a, a pose of, of, of violence, it makes the protesters want to lash out and you're giving them targets to throw bricks at. Mm-hmm. And I just wish our government would take the same approach that I've taken with my daughter. <laughs> and here is what we're trying to prevent, but we hear you. You are allowed mm-hmm. to challenge authority, but please remain respectful. Exactly. Same Think about anymore. what it would be like to have my job. It's really hard being a cop. Think about it from this side and know that I'm not responsible for every cop, but here's what's going on. And just listening to each other, which is 
talk back to that open communication with you and your child, that, that type of thing could solve so many issues in this world. Oh man. Yeah. I, um, I met, I'm, I briefly mentioned something like that on my, on my black lives matter episode that I did because people were talking about like rioting and, and, you know, angry protesters and um, you know, all the, all of the bad things that were coming from it. And I'm like, honestly, this is exactly what happens when people have been trying to talk and people have been trying to be heard for so long and they finally just get fed up that they have to start talking louder. That's their only option that they feel that they have left is to just start talking louder and making more noise. Because as we always say, so often the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I want to go, I want to go even further. I, I just released a show this morning uh, mm -hmm. called response to Sam Harris because Sam did a podcast, his episode of making sense. Uh, it's number 207 where he got into Black Lives Matter and police brutality and all of that. And I agreed with a lot of what he said, and then I disagreed with a lot of what he said. And my episode I just released is my response to him. I would love for you to go hear that. Okay. But <clears throat> one point that I make in there is exactly what you were just talking about, that it's not just that the squeaky wheel gets it. It's that understand that cops are saying, we, we're telling you what to do. You're not complying, so we are going to use force. And Sam's response is, let's have a conversation. Let's be nice. Let's talk about it. And I'm on board with that. Everything about my podcast is about 100%. having respectful yeah. conversations. But what happens when you've been talking nicely for 155 years? Exactly. What do you do then? Mm -hmm. Do you just continue to stand on the sidewalk holding a sign and hope your oppressor decides to give you five minutes of their time? Right. At what point do you demand it? And by the way, we the people are in charge in this country. Mm -hmm. Remember that. The police having power is an illusion that we allow and all agree to play by. And what we're saying now is stop the brutality. And I don't, I don't just mean the deaths. I mean stop, the, stop telling me I can't film you. Stop telling me you're going to take my phone. Stop your illegal search and seizure. Stop your mm -hmm. civil forfeiture, which is unconstitutional. Where you yeah. can just take my money even though I haven't committed a crime. Right. You think I might buy drugs with it. Yeah. S stop bullying me in the streets and telling me I can't do things that I'm not allowed to do. Stop talking to me with your hand on your gun to intimidate me. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. We're, and we're not asking. We the people are demanding. And if yeah. you don't comply, we will have to use force. Exactly. That's what's happening right now. And exactly. force, force is being used. So I'm not in favor of the rioting. No. I'm not. Me neither but I understand why it's happening exactly. and I'm not, I'm not mad that it's happening because it's um, we, you know, I watch a lot of Trevor Noah and the daily show and things like that um, just because he is the only, his show is the only show that can inform me and also make me laugh at it because otherwise I'll just be a hysterical mess 24 seven. I cannot watch news. John Oliver's and, great too. Okay. Way. I'll listen to him then too. <laughs> But, um, I, he, you know, just before all of this even happened, he talked about, I think it was, I, I don't remember the guy's name, but it was some older Senator basically that they found out that he had been doing something wrong and they, they took a SWAT team to his house and he was an older white gentleman. And it was just like a financial, something financial that he had done wrong, but he was going to go to jail for it. And when the entire SWAT sheet, the SWAT team showed up to his house to take him in he got mad and was like this is too much like I'm an 80 or 70 or 60 however old he was I'm like what am I gonna do what am I gonna do to you and you know Trevor Noah made the point during that time like we've been telling you guys for years that the police in the United States have way too much power they have way too much power going to their head and they do I personally have been victim of it myself and on top of that there was a video that I watched um 
I think that this may be one of the reasons that they uh, canceled the cops TV show is because there was a video that I watched of a, a white lady who called the police and said, my kid is stuck in the car and I need you to unlock my car and get my kid out. Right. And the guy, the police was the policeman that who showed up on scene was like, I don't see a kid in your car. Are you sure that there's a kid in your car? And she was clearly inebriated. And, um, she had lied is what wound up happening. There was no kid in her car. She just wanted the police to come and unlock her car because she didn't want to have to call a locksmith or something to come and do it. God. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. But what happened after that was they, they didn't even put her in handcuffs. Okay. They had a female officer hold her hands behind her back and hold her up against, or no, I'm sorry. Maybe they did put her in handcuffs actually, now that I'm thinking about it, but they had her hold her, hold the, the female officer held the woman against the car while the male officers searched the car and antagonized her and were just general douchebags to her the entire time. Like, like actually instigating for her to get angry and a couple times she like you know was was speaking angry slurs or whatever and you know tried to get up and go after them and the lady cop had to like wrestle her back into position basically and i'm like but why why do you even need to do that that's just bullying and it's just not nice and it's unnecessary i completely understand that she wasted your time and was clearly acting a fool but that doesn't mean that you get to do the same thing to her with the power that you have with great power comes great responsibility and with the power that you have you don't freaking abuse it and that's an abuse of power period you are going to love that episode that i just released okay <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, you're spot I can't on. Wait to listen I to think it. you could have done it better than I did. It's oh. very well done. That's exactly oh. it. Well, thank you. <laughs> I doubt it, but we'll see. Everybody, go listen, and you know we can compare. <laughs> yeah. Those cops—they just need better parents, right? There we go. <laughs> Respect and freedom. <laughs> yep. yep. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I hope that this helps you to write out all of your thoughts as well on it and that you can get your book written as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it will. It's helped me to clarify a few things. And I was taking notes as I was talking instead of reading from notes. And so I am going to be able to make an outline here and, uh, and hopefully get this thing started because I think it could help a lot of people. I really do. I absolutely agree with you. I just hope that people will read it. Oh, wait, you mean they might not? <laughs> Why would you put Some that into my head? read books. What's going on? I... <laughs> what a way Some to end the show. Good books. luck. Nobody's going to read your crap, but okay. See you later. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not like that. Stop it. Not like that. I hope Some people it. don't read books. When I was 18 and there was a book out um, whenever my son was born that was like, um, there was a couple of them, like how to survive up until like they were two or three or something like that and then how to survive pregnancy and i didn't read i didn't open a single one of them because reading takes time and that irritates me <laughs> audiobooks let's do it that way yes there you go see i'm all about audiobooks i'll read audiobooks read quote unquote audiobooks all day long right Same. but yeah all right well i appreciate you having me on it's been a lot Absolutely. of fun i appreciate you coming on it has thank you so much okay. and we'll talk again soon